Welcome to the product, everybody. If you're new, huge shout out to you guys. I'd uh, love to hang out with you after the service with a big squish, lemonade and bubble tea. Um, now, for those, um, if you want, there's going to be a QR code on the screen if you want to scan that code. Um, sermon notes and the message notes are available for you guys if you want to follow along. It is totally up to you, but it's just a resource for you right there. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but um, maybe some of you guys in this room have grown up in Sunday school. Uh, do you guys know what Sunday school is? Who's ever been to Sunday school? Okay, we have a few of you guys here. Maybe you've heard of Sunday school. Uh, now, I've been, um, I, I grew up in Sunday school. Now, my parents started going to church when I was 10 years old. Okay, now at 10 years old, I started embarking on that Sunday school journey. Now, I was back home in Ottawa, and my church was nothing like Hope City or The Project. From my church growing up, um, you, know the, you know God was moving if church went long. Like, I'm talking really long. Maybe you've been there, you've done that. Hopefully it wasn't at Hope City. Uh, but like, uh, the, the Spirit's moving if church went long. If the church stuck to their plan, well, God wasn't working. But I was, I was in that church in Ottawa growing up, and, and I remember uh, going up in Sunday school, and just picture my Sunday school teacher, her name is Madame Eleanor, and, um, you know, poor thing, which gracious lady, she's, a, she's working Monday to Friday, nine to five job, but she, this lady's got a real job, and not saying pastors aren't real jobs, um, but, but she's working nine to five Monday to Friday, but she loves Jesus so much that she gives up her free time to teach little kids in Sunday school. Okay, so during church service, Madame Eleanor, she's over there in, in classroom 1B while the church service is happening, and then all of a sudden the pastor gets the anointing of the Spirit, church terms, it's going to go long. Okay, so they're going past uh, the extended time or the allotted times in a church service. But the problem is, is that in this church, there's a lack of communication. And in classroom 1B, Madame Eleanor, poor thing, has a script. And the script can only take her so long. And so when this pastor over here is going way overboard, super long, because the Holy Spirit and God is moving, yada, 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 she is now out of material. So poor Madame Eleanor, working Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. She's now taking care of 18 rambunctious kids, one of them myself. And now she's just got to wing it. And she's going, she's pulling stuff out of her butt, just, just going at it. And she's, she's whipping out every Bible story she knows just to kind of keep us entertained. Man, did you know there was a Bible story about Daniel and he almost got eaten by a lion? And we're all like, wow, that's fantastic. We just did not talk about this before. And then it happened week after week after week after week. And then my Sunday school teacher found out and found a little loophole. He says, okay, if the pastor's going to go over service all the time, uh, I'm just going to do my own job. And so she went out and bought like a trivia book. So she went out to whatever bookstore, uh, Christian bookstore, and she bought a Bible trivia book. And so whenever the pastor would go long, she would whip out the trivia book and just like give us some, like, questions and, and, and quiz us and question us. Now, picture this. I'm 10 years old. I've never been a part of church before. My parents get saved into this church, and now I'm ingrained in the church community, and I'm going to Sunday school every single week. I'm 10 years old, but I picked up really quickly in the quiz moment, in the trivia challenge, whatever it is. I picked up very quickly that there's probably a good percentage that if I raise my hand and answer the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm probably going to get that answer correct. For example, the, the, the teacher's asking, who parted the Red Sea? Madame Eleanor, Jesus did. Yeah, you're kind of right. There's no way Moses parted the sea, and yeah, you're right. You're, you're totally right. So like, I would just ace it all the time. I would just like tell my friends the answers. It's Jesus. Say Lord Jesus Christ if you want to really hammer it in. And, and so every question, I would, I would raise my hand. I would just answer Jesus. And usually, percentage-wise, I would get it right. And I would, tell, I, would, I would think about this juvenile story and bring it today into the series that we're going through heavy hitters. And we're kind of journeying through the book of Romans, which I'm really excited about. And I'm really excited about this message because this is literally the heartbeat of the gospel, which is also the heartbeat of the project. 
But essentially, Paul, he's an author, and he's writing this letter to the city of Rome. Now, Rome at that day in first century um, early church Christianhood, uh, Rome was like a superpower. Very wealthy, a cultural hub, full of resources. And you know if Rome's a superpower city, they have a lot of influence. But the problem with this church in Rome is with, uh, so Paul is writing these thoughts down and he's kind of giving his heart, his blood, sweat, and tears and his heart in this message to give to them that he's encouraging them of the things that they're doing right and doing good, but he's also willing to give some advice on things that they could work on. And one of the things they could work on is that because this city is very intellectual, very modern for that day, they're taking the message of Jesus and they're kind of unraveling a little bit. And Paul is writing this letter to the Romans saying, hey, kind of like me, 10 years old at Sunday school, the answer is Jesus. And so Paul is trying to communicate to them, saying, hey, keep the main thing the main thing. Don't unravel things and make things complicated. Preach Jesus. Preach the way, which is what Christians were called back in the first century, following the way, and don't get it confused. And so yet uh, last week, we kind of kicked it off with Romans, talking about who Paul was, how confident he was, and conf- uh, Paul's confidence of the gospel came from the clarity of the gospel. Today, we're camping in Romans chapter 3. Now, Romans chapter 3, I'm really excited for it because um, it, 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 it's our heart for this church, and, but Let's, let's, let's read it, and then we'll pick it apart. So this is Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. It says, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And if this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, for everyone has sinned, We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty uh, penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this uh, present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Now I want to show you, this is my favorite book right here. So... It's called To Kill a Mockingbird. Now, I was first introduced to this story uh, when I was in grade 10. I was 15 years old, and um, I remember, I'm not an avid novel reader myself, but I remember when I was introduced to this book, it really got me in. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book or read this book in high school, but um, since 15 years old to this day, I'm I'm over 30 now, I have read this book every single year. And um, it, it... to, to put it short and to give a little synopsis, it's, uh, it was taking place in the Great Depression, and it, it's kind of witnessing a family account uh, of Scout and, 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 and Jim Finch and their father, Atticus, who's a famous lawyer, well-known uh, lawyer, who defends this black man who was falsely accused of rape. And you would read the story, and from a 10,000-foot view, you would automatically think, okay, the driving theme of this story is racial prejudice and injustice. But if you were to really nitpick it and take it apart, you would see really strong tones of other themes like good versus evil, bravery, knowledge, a loss of innocence, whatever. You can really grasp the themes of a book, and all that it stands for by its storytelling. Like, good storytelling isn't there just to entertain you, but is to bring you on this journey, on an adventure of whatever we're going on. And good storytelling is like, it takes you on this emotional roller coaster ride. And every turn, as characters develop, as the, 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 the plot hits a curveball, A story like this, a good story, gives you a greater perspective on a particular thing or just on society as a whole. 
The author is trying to communicate to you and, try, and trying to attempt to allow you to feel the same things that they're feeling, seeing the same, the same things they're seeing, and experiencing the same things they're experiencing. Now, we all know, and if you love reading stories, if you're an av- avid novel reader, you know this, is that a story is more than a story. It amplifies the greater picture and, give, and gives you a deeper understanding and appreciate for what's in front of you. And that's just a story written merely by a human author with a limit to their thinking and to their offering. What I just read to you in Romans chapter 3 is a whole different story. This is a story of freedom. Not freedom that we can just rally around and just get inspired by, but a freedom, a story of freedom that brings true transformation to your soul from the inside out. And this story doesn't just give you a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it instills true hope and gives you purpose and allows you to wake up in the morning when you don't feel like waking up. It allows you to push and to love and to live life when things don't really go your way. Now, I won't give my life to kill a mockingbird. It's a great story, but I wouldn't die for it. I would give my life to this story. I would give my all, and I will put all my eggs in the basket for this one. It's a story that's mind-boggling about a love so reckless, so overwhelming that it's almost too good to be true. This is the gospel story. This is the story of Jesus. And this is the heartbeat of the project. I love this specific translation. It's from the, it's from the message. But I love how it communicates this portion of Scripture. And this is what it says. It says, His gift of love and favor now cascades over us, all because of Jesus, the anointed one, who has liberated us, get this, listen carefully, from guilt, punishment, and the power of sin. He changed my story. And for many people in this room, he has changed other stories. He's changed our stories because he decided to take on the the guilt and the punishment and the sin onto him. We are born bad people. But I hold the door for that grandma the other day. Okay, easy. We all suck. We're going down this path that has extreme consequences, and Jesus took on it all for himself. His sacrifice, which is considered the ultimate sacrifice, has eliminated it once and for all. Eliminated. It's gone. Like, I I don't know. I grew up, uh, I grew up a big soccer fan. I grew up soccer my entire life. I'm an avid fan. People who know me, I cheer for Liverpool as a club in England. And, you know, when the World Cup goes around, I am just huge. I'm a fanatic. I cry. I'm an emotional wreck. I cheer for England. My mom's British. And I remember in 2018, um, we almost made it so far, but I felt like a dagger hit my chest when England got eliminated. Now, who would agree with me that England as they got eliminated from the semifinals, would just grab their gear and stroll on to the finals and play to the next stage. No, they wouldn't. They would go home because they've been eliminated. They're not allowed to come back. Tonight's message centers around the guilt and the shame that we often carry. Now, I'm not going to ask everyone to raise their hands because I'm sure it's inevitable that all of us have faced some sort of guilt, shame, or situation that we've been condemned in the past. The message of Jesus is that the guilt and condemnation that we face has totally been eliminated. It is not welcome. It is not invited back into your life. Guilt and punishment has been exchanged for what we call grace and salvation. Now, there's a few things I would love for you to remember from tonight's talk and this little simple message. For those who call yourselves a Christian or a Christ follower, this message is going to be a simple one. But, like myself, reading through the story, I'm constantly reminded by the beautiful nature of what the gospel story actually means. And so whether you've been here for like, if you've been a Christian for years and years and years, this is a simple one, but a really good reminder. The first thing is that Jesus took on the guilt. Jesus took the guilt. Now, like I mentioned before, nobody in this room is exempt from guilt. We've all been there, whether it was saying something we never wanted to say or do something we never wanted to do or be in a situation that it's really, we we kind of feel ashamed in that. If not taking a look at 
Now, guilt, or the concept of guilt, can really mark your life. Guilt is a heaviness that none of us are meant to carry. It torments us, it haunts us, it isolates us. Guilt is a powerful thing if we allow it to remain in our lives. And you know, at first, you and I can get away with it. But after some times, it becomes this weight, it becomes this burden that kind of really, at first we can kind of take care of it, but after some time it really affects everything that we do and it permeates everything we say and how we react. Take a look at um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. This is what it says. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by uh, such a, a, a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time, you probably have seen or heard of this verse. Pastors, preachers have probably taken this verse and preached a variety of themes from it. But for me and for us tonight, I want to take a look at this one particular point. It says, um, the weight, the sin that so easily trips us up. Now, I'm not saying that Guilt is necessarily a straight-up thing. But it is something that God has never intended you to go through. So if, I, if I'm, for example, okay, let's say this bag is a part of my life, okay? Jesus has promised us, as he said in his word, life to the fullest, okay? And he's called you and I to live life completely free. Now, if this bag is a part of me, okay, it looks fantastic, satchel, it rocks with the fit. Now, I can do whatever I want. I can walk. I can do jumping jacks. I can do whatever. This is a part of me, but this is not really bringing in resistance or any some sort of weight or whatever it is. Now, if I were to put some stuff into it, I've got some kettlebells, my wife's, not to show off, but I sometimes go to the gym. Now, if I were to go and put all this weight in, okay, so that's one, no, 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 no. Okay, that's a lot of weight. Okay, so now this bag's supposed to be heavy. Yep, it's heavy. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, if I were to go and walk around like this, all right, let's just go here for a second. Now, at first, the weight could be fine, but as you can see, I'm kind of struggling. I should go to the gym more. I'm panting. I'm like releasing breath now. Now I'm walking, and as you can see, now I'm walking with a limp, okay? Because I'm now trying to carry this weight all around me here, okay? So I'm walking. I'm going back and forth. Now, as you can see, before I was doing jumping jacks totally fine, and I was living free. But this weight, the more and more I carry it, now I can be fine to carry this for a few moments, the whole service maybe. Don't make me do it. It'll just be really awkward. But I can do it for a few hours, but what if you carry this around you wherever you go Monday, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, so on and so forth, 24-7. No matter what, or no matter how strong you are, this is going to start to literally weigh you down. And your posture is going to change. You're going to start breathing heavy. There's resistance. And you're not going to live life as Jesus promised to give you. This is what guilt can cause for your life. For you to not be able to live in freedom. But on the cross, Jesus, through what we read in Romans 3, has encouraged us, not just encouraged us, has invited us to throw all this weight, all the guilt, all the shame, all the mistakes onto the cross because he made the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. When we carry the guilt, it causes us to be heavy. It causes us to be tired. But Jesus has called us to live life free. He's called us to run with every strip of weight off of us. Now, we talked about how Jesus took the guilt, but he exchanged that guilt for gratitude. Jesus took the guilt, but he exchanged the guilt for gratitude. Now, although it might sound a little cliche, don't underestimate the power of gratitude. When we receive uh, salvation, Jesus just calls us to be grateful. But thankfulness, 
it could really forge new paths like in our lives like nothing else. Now, there's just this author named A.J. Jacobs. He's a non-Christian. He's an author and journalist, and he's a non-Christian, but took on this challenge on living a whole year um, doing everything the Bible told him to do, and he wrote a book about it. He actually called it Living a Whole Year Biblically. Now, in his book, I'll read a quote. It says this, One of the big life-changing lessons that still stays with me is a sense of gratitude. And that's because the Bible tells us to say prayers of thanksgiving all the time. I would say dozens or hundreds a day. Like I'd press a button and say, thanks for the elevator coming, and then thankful that the elevator didn't plummet when I got on it. It was a strange way to live, but also wonderful. But I did have to say I learned how many things go right. If that alone had been the lesson of the Bible, that would have been enough. Interesting, huh? And even on a, on a physical level, a psychologist named Joel Wong, who specializes in mental health, said that gratitude has a number of scientific benefits. Number one, gratitude opens a door to more relationships. Two, gratitude improves mental health. Three, gratitude enhances empathy and reduces aggression. Four, grateful people sleep better. And five, great, uh, gratitude improves self-esteem. If this is true, if it's true that this type of love of the gospel washes away your past, present, and future mistakes, if it's true that Jesus gives eternal purpose, if it's true that I and you don't have to do this life alone, then we would all naturally be thankful and live continuously in that gratitude. That's why from one end of the Testaments to the other, we have authors that recount this gratitude. Paul, the same author in Romans, writes a different letter to the Corinthians. He says, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. And then in the Old Testament, David, the writer of this book called Psalms, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole, my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. So you could try and do everything you want to, friends. You can try and plan, write, perform, execute. But the best way to live a successful life as a, as a believer is take that guilt and live in gratitude. Live with a thankful heart. So the next thing we know about tonight's talk is that he didn't just take the guilt, but he also took the punishment. The Bible says, and I know it's kind of hard to hear, especially those who are checking church out, but the Bible is very explicit and clear that the consequences of the mistakes that you and I do, the consequences of sin, is death. And I'm not talking about death, about just losing your life in this life. I'm talking about a decay. A decay is this rotting thing that happens to your soul. When decay happens, it loses its flavor, its potency, and strength, and even its life. In that decay, it draws you more of a separation from you and God. And when we distance ourselves from him, we start to lose focus on our identity and our confidence, which we talked about last week, and even our hope. But Jesus, Jesus took on that punishment that we deserved. And if you've been in church for any length of time, it can be a lofty thing to say at times. Like, oh yeah, he forgave us. Oh yeah, he paid the price. But what you and I want to really know is that, does God even care about me? Does he, does he lo truly love me? As a matter of fact, yes, he does. He does. And on top of that, he was willing to put on flesh and bone and go through the same pain that you and I went through and still came out on top. Where in the world do you see that? And on top of that, he didn't just save you just to hold it over your head. No, 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 no. He sees you as a son. And he sees you as a daughter. That's what the Bible talks about. That God, Jesus didn't save you just to like hate on you still or to hold it over your head. No, he calls you a son. He calls you a daughter. He calls you family. And for those who know that, like you're a son or you're a daughter, you know how if you have a loving parent, you know you understand the weight of that. And even though you never grew up with a father or a mother, that is, that is a relationship that we all want, that we all crave, that we all desire. And Jesus, through the gospel, through the cross, and through this story, is offering that to us. 
I've been a Christian since I was 17 years old. And still, time after time after time, I'm learning a new thing about the cross. I'm learning a new thing about the gospel. And it mind boggles me. I hope it does for you too. So as he took that punishment, he exchanged it for purpose. He didn't just take on the weight of the world just so you can be thankful. That's a huge part, yes. But he also opened a door that you can walk into your purpose. We kind of talked about it last week, your calling versus your career, and what the difference was. Your career is what you're paid to do. Your calling is what you're made to do. And, and your purpose kind of fits into that calling. And your purpose is ingrained in your DNA. Every part of you is designed for a reason. Every part of you. Your brain which is about 10,000 million cells and has another 10,000 million to 100 million connections, makes it the most complex machine the universe has ever seen. The eye, in which the retina has been deemed the most, uh, more complex than any other electron microscope or satellite spy camera in the world, or even as something overlooked like the liver, which extraordinarily uses this complex chemical refinery system that purifies our blood in order to live. Now, I can go on and on about the different functions of your body, but what we need to understand is that in all those functions and the holistic body and the soul within that body, God loves you so much that he created everything. He designed everything for the very best purpose. You don't go unnoticed, friend. You are not alone in this life. As Ephesians puts it, God considers you his masterpiece. You are literally the Mona Lisa of his work. This climactic moment of like, yes, you, you, you. I call you my son. I call you my daughter. And on beyond that, he's made that ultimate sacrifice. He gave up his life so you and I can have one. Now, We'll be doing something tonight that honestly means the world to me. And we haven't done this in a while because of COVID, and now we're so excited just to kind of reintroduce this as a, as a rhythm and as a, as a routine for us. I don't want to call it a routine, but a nice remembrance moment. And um, that's communion. Um, communion is a practice and a tradition that's been done for over 2,000 years since the early church began. It's this beautiful sacrament. It's this beautiful ritual, but also has huge implications for our lives still to this present day. Um, it wasn't meant to be this, it wasn't meant to be this upright ritual that is done for the holy and the holiest. It was to bring into remembrance the act of love Jesus did for us. And Jesus knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to rise again before anyone of us. But since Jesus was both fully God and fully man, even though he was meant to be on the throne of heaven, he came down to this earth and just put down the God card and fully embrace humanity. And what does that mean, fully embracing humanity? Well, he felt the same pain you and I felt. He suffered through the same things you and I felt. And right before he was going towards the cross, he was, he was sweating so aggressively that it's called, uh, it's a medical term for it, it's called hematohydrosis, where you literally sweat blood. That's how aggressive it was. That's how much pain Jesus was feeling before he went towards the cross. It wasn't an easy task for him, and it, but it wasn't an obligation as well. He chose to go into that cross for the sake of the world. Communion is a time where we posture ourselves to remember that God loves you so much that he was willing to go through all that pain and suffering and still come out on top. He took the guilt. He took the punishment. And as I take communion, I remember that he also took on the power of sin. No more will the people of the project be limited no more will we be held, uh, held back. Through God's power and through his love, we are truly set free. We're truly embarking on eternal life with him forever. Now, 
I want to invite all of you to take communion together. Now, the emblems will be at the front. We have one um, bucket here and one bucket or container there. If you're new or just checking out the project, please, you don't have to take part of it. If you don't feel comfortable, it's all good. You can just stay at your seat. For everyone else, um, before you come and grab the, uh, the emblems, I want to ask you a few questions. Because I don't want this to be like, oh, I'm going to take some crackers and juice and just, yeah, good. But I want to ask you to just ponder a few things. There's going to be a couple questions on the screen as they are now. And I want you kind of like, you, you heard the message. Yeah, it was a simple teaching. But now, how does that apply to me? How does that apply to Reuben in 2022? And so the band's going to play it. They're going to lead us a song. And how it's going to work is, I want you to have a chance to kind of reflect on these questions. What kind of guilt or shame have you been experiencing lately? Do you feel at times worthy to be a Christ follower? What is a weight that's holding you down and that needs to be given to Jesus? I'm going to give you a few seconds, a few moments. The band's going to play. And whenever you're ready, I just like for you just to come on up, grab an emblem, and don't take it here. Just bring it back to your seat, um, and then we're, we're going to take it together. So let me pray for you, and uh, I'm going to invite you guys to come stand and grab an emblem whenever you're ready, and then we'll just lead through communion for, uh, for a few moments. And Jesus, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the moments where you come and you've made the cross, the gospel, the, the, the good news a reality. As we remember what you did for us, may we not think of it as a concept or as this brand, but as a true moment of you on the cross dying for us. And so may we not be living um, life for a concept or an idea or an experiment, but you are real. This is not just an idea. This is a person, and that's you. And so as we remember, may we just follow your footsteps in that dust. May we just follow that choreography of everything that you're doing. May we just kind of follow in your footsteps there. And God, anything that we feel at this moment, if we're feeling shameful or guilty or just not at peace about something, I pray, God, that you would just remind us of your, of, of your story, of the cross, of your forgiveness yet once again. So, Father, we give everything to you. In Jesus' name, amen. The band's going to play whenever you're ready. Come on down, grab an emblem, and um, head back to your seat, and we'll take communion in a few moments.